Good morning or good afternoon. It's just at that time between morning and afternoon. Welcome to a Calvinian architecture, the first octave, the fourth chapter, Zaida. These stories were written as a response to Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. They were written all at once with no editing, <clears throat> each on the morning or afternoon of one of the performances that I presented for Invisible Cities. Enough of the explanation. There's never enough context, but here is what I wrote. He'd walk each day from our room to the room he rented from his son in order to sew and cut cloth. Parting from him, I must have been four or five, was always difficult for me, and it's only recently that I figured out why. It was the silent space between us, the widening of my world to include his inside a kind of bubble where we would exist complicitly. <clears throat> where I would feel safe. One morning I decided to follow him just so I could stay inside the bubble longer. He used a cane to help himself along, one leg being shorter than the other, the result of a childhood break, never properly healed. So his progress wasn't too fast. I dodged people looming over me and stand in doorways whenever he'd look back until he reached a little four-roomed apartment in the shadows of the town hall. It was dark and dank in the stairway, that T.S. Eliot line of six o'clock smell of steak in, in passageways always immediately brings me back physically to that October in 1952. I followed him up three floors, stopping whenever he stopped for breath finally slipping behind him in the doorway and hid in the other room, empty, except for a huge map of the world. For hours I sat on the floor in front of it, my face level with the strange shape of a land named Australia. Eventually in the late afternoon, after hours of hearing only the sound of hissing steam coming from the other room, each time his iron pressed down on damp cloth over and over again, and the occasional curse when the needle penetrated the index finger of his left hand, he'd disdained thimbles all his life. Suddenly I heard my uncle's worried voice asking for me. He'd been dispatched by my mother to find me. My grandfather didn't answer, or at least I didn't hear it. My uncle's face then appeared in a doorway as he handed me my coat. I shook my head. I'm not cold, I said. In silence, he led me home. Not a word was said all the way down the Corso Garibaldi past the pasticceria lit up brightly in an early autumn dusk. He'd been carrying the coat my mother had given him at the last moment to cover me up. So as we got closer to home, he stopped in the doorway of a shoe shop to help me put it on. As he fastened the top button under my chin, he said quietly, now look at me, how did he know? How did your grandfather know that you were in there? How did he know? Because when I asked him if he'd seen you, he just looked up at me and turned his head toward the map room. That's what the empty room was known as, the map room. And lifted his eyebrows toward the ceiling like this. My uncle then mimicked my grandfather's turning of the head. I looked away, but I could see him turning his head reflected in the shop window. He was genuinely puzzled. He looked quietly through the glass at the shiny shoes displayed inside the shop for a long time. Elegant shoes with high heels and buckles. He seemed more worried by my grandfather knowing I was in the map room than by my running away. After carefully examining the array of shoes, he looked at me and shrugged and said, let's go. 
we stopped at the pasticceria on the corner of our street and miracle of miracles he bought four cakes two francesine and two cannoli wrapped in shiny white paper he suddenly seemed to be in such a celebratory mood he smiled broadly at me and started intoning his favorite aria la donna immobile that night my grandfather ar arrived home later than usual I was sitting at the table waiting for him and drawing something when he carefully placed a green cloth on my open drawing book. It was strangely shaped but had beautifully sewn edges. It had been ironed too. I could tell from the inebriating smell of vinegar that now permeated the room that he'd taken special care with this particular cloth. Crisper edges, he would always say as he spread the rags over his sewing before reaching out for the hot iron. I turned the patch round and round and over and over, but I didn't recognize anything. Finally, he said, come on, silly. Don't you recognize it? It's a map of Australia. Verse three, there's one sure place where I'd want to live. I saw it in a dream. Unlike the other stories, it's not a house, but a place, a space really. It's a long time ago now, but it was like a dream is sometimes when you know you're inside it. And inside it, I was. Impossible to explain how, but I'll try. It was a river bank with no water. So green and grassy and sloping, very silent like the silence you might hear when you press your ear to a shell or the sound sky and water make all along the seashore on windy days gathered by innocent ears from as far as the horizon reaches. Well, it was like that. It was also very green, all the shades of it, and the feeling was like that too. There were cypresses standing very still and straight. I remember waking up and probably the only time I felt this, mind you, probably the only time I remember waking up like this, I was feeling good that I was in Australia, feeling that I really liked its strange shape or its dreamy familiarity. It seemed a shape that simply couldn't be any other. It had no choice but to be what it is, a strange shape, a strange faraway land shape called Australia. So back to the dream. Well, that's where I'd like to live, in that green space by the dry, moist river. Back in that silence, listening to a kind of breathing going on, knowing that it wasn't mine, and yet somehow al almost knowing that it was most certainly mine. There's an alternate ending to that. Back in that silence, listening to a kind of breathing going on, knowing that it wasn't mine, and yet somehow also knowing that it most certainly was. I prefer the latter. These stories have no punctuation and no comments or capital letters or hyphens, and they have strange spaces between the words. They were written in the way that I was breathing when I wrote them. That perhaps explains the gaps and spaces in my telling. Until tomorrow, the fifth chapter of the first octave, keynote is Do, the color is red, and the name of the city is Anastasia. Thank you for listening.